Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's Hope Restored. Thanks for joining us again. Let me pray, and then we're going to go into worship. Father, we thank you, as always, for your kindness and your love. We thank you that in the good times and the bad times, you are with us. And we pray that as we worship you now, we would just give our whole beings over to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're starting this week with the song, Raise a Hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies A hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a man. 
So the song that we've just been uh, listening to and singing was recorded by the Redmonds and it was a time when they really were struggling and things had gone uh, from bad to worse in their lives. But through all the difficult times, through the highs and the lows, God is with us and he is strengthening us and helping us through. And we really believe that. We really believe that God is on our side. And whatever you're facing this week, just know this, that God is on your side every step of the way. So we're going to uh, be listening to the message in a moment for this week. And just to remind everyone that uh, we are live every Thursday at 12.45 in the afternoon and 7.45 in the evening. You're welcome to join us. Do tell other people, get other people to join us as well. It'd be great to have more people along. So this week's message is the part four of Keep the Change and it's entitled Like a Hawk and it's based on Nehemiah. We're in this series of messages that we've called uh, Keep the Change and uh, we've laid out uh, picking the right change. That was week one. Week two was making sure we have the right power for change. Uh, the third installment, we talked about uh, a plan for change that we would hear consistently act instantly, that we would speak carefully, and that we would serve constantly. And that's going to be our plan for change. Uh, but that's not enough. It's not, listen, it's not enough to change. And that's kind of the heart behind the series. It's not enough to change. I came across this statistic because, you know, there's, there's crash diets and extreme, you know, surgical methods and things that people do to lose a drastic amount of weight. And it's been popularized on different TV shows and stuff. But the statistic I read that was that two-thirds of those who go through a crazy extreme amount of losing weight, two-thirds of them will put their weight back on. And so the point is changing is only half the battle. In any regard, that's true. That's just one illustration. I could pick any one of them because changing is only half the battle. The real, the real fun, the real fight, the real discipline comes in when you learn to protect your progress, to protect your progress. And that's what we're going to do uh, this weekend by God's grace. Uh, we're going to learn to look at ourselves like a hawk, like a hawk. Come on, say that out loud with me. It's just fun to say, like a hawk. It's like a hawk. We're going to learn to protect our progress by watching ourselves like a hawk. And uh, the definition from the dictionary of that phrase, that idiom, is to watch something very closely, to watch something very closely. And that's our assignment. Our job is going to be, as we change, the moment we do, as that's happening, if we're going to protect our progress and not revert and not relapse, if we're not going to lose the change but keep the change, which is, gosh, if we're going to fight for some change, let's not lose it. Let's keep it. Let's protect our progress. you got to watch yourself like a hawk. How you got to watch yourself? Like a hawk. Almost like you're saying like a boss, but like a hawk like a hawk and that's going to be the new expression we're protecting our progress and once more with feeling all god's people said nehemiah is an amazing book of the bible he is a guy who is gripped with a dream uh, he had um, heard about what was going on in jerusalem while he was a, uh, a part of the exile living far away from jerusalem in uh, a place called Persia, or formerly known as Babylon. There was a regime change. And uh, so he worked for a king, and his job was to bring the king his wine glass, to bring the king his cup. And the king would uh, drink it only after Nehemiah did, if Nehemiah didn't die. So it was a dangerous job, because if Nehemiah ever died after taking a sip, uh, then the king would immediately not drink it. That was pretty much his job. He was like a, a bomb-sniffing dog, but a human version, you know? And so uh, he would make sure no one was trying to kill the king. And, and that gave him access to the king. Well, um, the, the nation had been in exile for, for over a century. And, um, and, and Nehemiah heard a fresh report about what was happening in Jerusalem because there had been several attempts to kind of get things going back again, to get things built back up again, for there to be some glorious ruins re being rebuilt in Jerusalem. And this had happened, a couple different attempts had, had taken place, and, and someone brought back news to Nehemiah. Nah, it was not successful. They told him this. Listen, listen. They told him, they told him the walls are torn down 
and the gates are burned with fire, and the people are full of grief. The people are terrorized. And when Nehemiah heard that, it just broke his heart. And he just got so mad about it. He got, God, God sort of touched him when he heard that and said, Nehemiah, that's the spot. I need you. That's, that's what you're going to do for me. And you know what Nehemiah did? He acted instantly. He acted instantly. How, what, what did that mean? That means he grabbed the king's cup and brought it in and gave it to the king. Meaning he kept doing what he was doing with the dream in his heart still. But as he did it, God opened up doors. God opened up opportunities for him to get what was in his heart into the world through what was in his hand. And some of us would have made the mistake of, of throwing down the king's cup and said, I can't be serving the king's cup. I got a call from God in my life. I'm supposed to go do something. But God almost always gets what's in our heart into the world through what's already in our hands. And we got to be faithful where, where we're at. So many of us make the mistake of rushing out to pursue a calling before it's time because God wants us to be faithful in small things so we can be entrusted with more. And many of us have been given dreams we're not ready for yet, but it will be unlocked in due season if we don't get impatient. And so Nehemiah kept doing the small stuff, just like David did. David gets a new anointing, just keeps taking care of the sheep, keeps bringing food to his brothers. He's the, he's the blooming king of Israel. But no, he's just being faithful in small stuff. And in time, it came to pass. So, so Nehemiah brings the cup in. King's like, yo, you look sad. Yeah, brokenhearted about my, my people. Well, is there anything I can do about that? Well, you can give me money, and you can give me bodyguards, and you can give me access and a passport and a governorship. And the king's like, yeah, that's cool. Just how long do you think it'll take? I think I can get it done in this long. Go at it. Go at it. How did God get what was his heart into, in his heart into the world through what was in his hand? So don't despise whatever's in your hand because it is not the enemy to getting what's in your heart out. It is going to be the very way that God brings it to pass. If you're faithful, if you don't rush, if you don't do anything hasty, bloom where you're planted, don't miss the ministry that's under your nose. You got a referee's whistle in your hand? Use it. You got, you got, a, you got, a, you got a piece of chalk in your hand, teacher? Use it. You got a stethoscope in your hand? Use it. You, got a, you drive an Uber? You got the steering wheel in your Use it. Are you a mom? You, you cook meals and do, use it. Use it. You, God wants to use what's in your hand to release what's in your heart. Not my sermon. So uh, Nehemiah uh, goes and, and rebuilds uh, with the people of Israel, rebuilds all the walls. They had been broken down for 141 years. Better men than he had tried to do it. Religious like leaders had tried. No one had been able to. Just a cupbearer. God, God needed the cupbearer to, with, with a vision, with a dream, with a call of God in his life. So don't tell me you're unqualified. Don't tell me you can't do something great for God. This, this guy's only qualification was drinking Kool-Aid for a living and almost dying. And, and so he ends up 52 days. That's how long it took. 52 days to do what couldn't be done in 141 years. And that's even more impressive when you consider the obstacles and the opposition and the difficulty that came up as they tried to do this thing. Because there were these haters. Uh, side note, always going to be haters when you do something great for God. So get over it. It's not going to stop. So these guys, their names were, get this, Sanballat, Geshem, and Tobiah, who I like to call the fantastic Mr. Fox. Because um, they showed up to hate on everything Nehemiah and the people were doing. And they, I wrote down a little list of the kinds of things that they resorted to. Here we go. Uh, they mocked uh, the Jews. They criticized them. They defamed Nehemiah, blackmailed him personally, intimidated them, opposed them, and even sent death threats to them. Like, we're going to kill you in your sleep and stuff like that. Why do I call Tobiah the fantastic Mr. Fox? Because one time he came to watch the Jews building this wall. Because in the ancient world, you could not have a city without walls. It was not safe. And the Bible says, by the way, about your own life, a person who has no control over their spirit is like a city whose walls have been broken down. So there's no safety. Anyone can come in. Anyone can go out. Anyone can bring something dangerous in. Anyone can take something out. So the city had to have walls before it could be safe for the people to be there. And so, um, and so it is inside your soul. So they're building up the walls. And Tobiah comes one day and goes, those walls are terrible. And everyone's like, thanks. It's like building a wall here. Those, those walls are the worst walls I've ever seen. And they're like, OK, cool. That's awesome that you think that. And, and then he goes, that wall is so bad, if even a fox got on top of it, it's going to fall down. Ooh, burn, dis, yeah. And he like looked to his friends, and they're like, dude, you're the worst. <laughs> so I like to call him the fantastic Mr. Fox, just for that reason only. So anyhow, these three, like, what was their problem? Well, they stood to to lose ground if the Jews took ground. 
And there's going to be some people in your life who they think that the more you are de decrease, the more they increase. But that's not true. Because blessing, it's a, it's, it's, God's got his own blessing for each one of us. And so just this idea, if I tear you down, if I cut into you, if I hold you back, it's going to and somehow make me feel better. It always makes you look, 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 look weak. It always makes you look small to tear other people down. It never causes you to gain in status, never causes you to gain into influence. If you try and make people feel small, it just makes you look small. And, uh, and yet, that's what they thought. And they had a financial interest in, in, in staying in control of the trade, staying in control of these things. And so they did not want the, 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 the heart of Nehemiah to come out into the world. They did not want this, this call from God to be realized. And, and so all through this thing, they had opposition. Uh, matter of fact, it got so bad, Nehemiah issued this. This is chapter 4, that the people had to work on the, on the wall with a sword strapped to their side as they worked. And, and that was his response to the intimidation. He's like, everybody strap on your sword. And, and so they, from that point on, they built, listen to this, with a sword in one hand and a shovel in the other. And you just got to love that mentality that they were ready to defend what they were building. We got to always be ready to defend in our lives what God's building. And you know, we got to protect your progress. So they get done with the wall, 52 days, this thing's done. Nobody believed it could be done, but everybody knew that God had done this thing, and, and it could not have been done and explained humanly. And, uh, and, and, and so what next? Well, after 52 days of building came 24 days of revival. 24 days of, of, of church service, 24 days of singing God, to God, 24 days they marched around the walls. And guess what? They didn't come falling down. All the people marched on the wall. Take that, Tobiah, put it in your fox um, and smoke it. And that doesn't make any sense, Pastor. I know. I'm just moving right along. Listen, listen, listen. 24 days of revival. Why? Because the walls were built, but the people were not. And if they didn't deal with spiritually what was wrong inside of them, then the walls wouldn't matter because they would still have no control over their spirit, you see? And the reason for the exile, the reason they had lost the privilege of living in the promised land was because of three things, time, money, relationship, idolatry. Time, money, relationships. And idolatry actually is under all three of the first ones. I don't even need to say idolatry. I, could just, I didn't need to say the other three. I could say idolatry. Um, because the way they were spending their time, they did not honor God with it. They, they, he said, in that paradigm, in that dispensation, in that day, you're supposed to take a whole day off and rest. And we should have that principle of rest and, uh, and, and just kind of as a rhythm of life. But uh, it was a way of trusting God because they were saying, I believe, God, you're going to provide for me if I take a day off in six days. But my worship of you, well, you'll, you'll provide as though I had been working that day and even beyond. But they weren't doing that for a long time. They weren't trusting God with their time. Uh, they were not honoring God with their finances. They hadn't been tithing. They haven't giving. Haven't been doing any of the things uh, that would keep their hearts aligned to heaven. I think it was Warren Wiersbe who said, "Whenever someone's soul begins to slip, you always first see it show up in their finances, because our hearts are so tightly connected to heaven." So that's a good way to keep the poles. You're like, I wish there was a way to know if I'm on fire for God. Yeah, just look at your checkbook. You'll find out because your heart it, it, it tells what your, your your finances are doing. So anyhow, um, the, their time, their 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 money, and then their relationships. They were being aligned to and and forming alliance with and dating people that, that they were pulling them away from God, marrying people that were pulling them away from God, just as Solomon had, which started the decline after the glory days of David. And that's what began the division of the nation and all the weakening that happened, which is why our Swipe Right series that starts up in just three weeks' time is so important, this book coming out of the world, to learn how our relationships can, cannot get in the way of our forward progress by us making the wrong uh, decisions when it comes to our love life. So those are the three things, and they were all elements of idolatry, which is really the umbrella over all of them. They were worshiping other, other gods and prioritizing things before, before God, which is why they wouldn't honor God with their money, which is why they wouldn't honor God with their time, which is why they were uh, getting into these bad alliances. So what they did during these 24 days of revival was they, they studied God's word. Because hearing consistently is, is, and then acting instantly is the only hope of change, as then you speak carefully and you serve constantly. And so uh, Ezra gets up on this platform. It's the first 
podium in all of scripture because they put him on a raised platform and he reads the, 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 the Bible a little bit, then he explained it to him. He read the Bible, then he explained it to him. He read the Bible a little bit. He did what I'm doing right now. He read the Bible a little bit. He explained it to him. And then they broke up into small groups and discussed it. How amazing is it? They literally got into groups right then and there during this time. They were just, just they were in a fresh life group. Discuss what that, what did you get out of that? What what God tell you to do? How would you put it into practice this week, right? And, 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 and so you go because you see what, what God ignites on a Sunday you got to plow through on a Monday. I'm telling you, it just has to happen. And, uh, and so that's what they were choosing to do. And uh, so it was beautiful. And, and, and they began to be convicted deeply as they read passages about time and about money and about relationships. Someone said, the Bible's not relevant. Are you kidding me? Is this not still our life today? We've got problems in our time, got problems in our money, got problems in our relationships. And so as they began to get these things aligned, the people were so sad. And the people were just, they, it was like God opened their eyes up to see in the mirror, dang. We brought this on ourselves. And so they said, they said we, we want to make a covenant, Nehemiah. We want to promise to God that this is not going to happen anymore. And look at this. So, so because of all this stuff, we make a sure covenant, and we write it. Our leaders, our Levites, I like them already, and our priests, they seal it. Okay. In the next chapter, listen, in the next chapter is the names of every head of every household, every family. They came and wrote their name down. Like, yeah, me too. I'm going to honor God with my time. I'm going to honor God with my money. I'm going to honor God with, with my relationships. Yes, friends, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to act in that's what happened. It was beautiful and, uh, and, and amazing and so strong. And uh, it, it ended like this. And we will not forsake the house of our God. That's how it ended. We will not forsake the house of our God. We're not going to uh, not give so that there could be food in God's house. We're always going to fight so that, that the church can expand. We're always going to, we're not going to forsake the house of of our God. And Nehemiah's like, amazing, amazing, amazing. And so guess what he does? He goes back to Babylon. He goes back to the, the Persia. And he, uh, he begins to, uh, what does he do? Well, he didn't get too big for what was in his hand originally. So he goes back. God, God did something great for him. Yes, OK, I'm going to go back to the simple things that I've always been called to do. And uh, 10 years goes by. 10 years goes by. And uh, we would be tempted, if we were writing the story to make the movie, we would just say happily ever after, right? Um, uh, but unhappily, things unraveled. And um, now we pick it up. We're all caught up sufficiently. And uh, 10 years go goes by. Nehemiah comes back to visit. And in verse 4 of Hebrew, uh, ne Hebrews, Nehemiah 13, it says this. Now, before this, before Nehemiah got there, Eliashib, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. <laughs> what did I just read? It's not real. It can't be real. But it is real. And it gets worse, guys. He had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded, commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offerings for the priests. But during all this, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Come on, Nehemiah. Come on, bro. Just goes and just starts chucking all his IKEA furniture out the window. <laughs> it's like my favorite mental picture I've ever had in my life. Nehemiah's like, get me my sword and get me my shovel. <laughs> the snake bird has entered the situation. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms. He's like, get some Lysol. Don't Tobias germs all over this thing. And I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. 
I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them, for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? Because remember that one time when y'all were like, we will not forsake the house of our God. And then notice up in verse 15, it says, in those days, I also saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with, with the, the nobles of Judah, and I said to them, what evil thing is this you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not our fathers do thus? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded them that the gates would be shut. Someone say, shut the gates. And charged that they must not be open till after the Sabbath. Then I posted some of my servants at the gates so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Yes. From that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. I bet they didn't. Crazy old Nehemiah all up in their face. <laughs> and I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. And I don't, I don't have time to read it, but we also, if we read on in the chapter, could talk about Nehemiah seeing people beginning to have romantic movements towards people they shouldn't be. And he literally grabbed them by their hair and their beards and dragged them out of the backseat of the car that was all steamed up and said, you're coming with me. <laughs> I will, you, you will not be swiping that direction anymore. That's for dang sure. What's happening here? The answer is they are in the process of losing the change. As Nehemiah went away, so did their progress. Entropy, decay, a slow leak. The second law of thermodynamics Assuming something will always be as hot as it was. Assuming something will always be as powerful as it once was. Assuming that, like Samson, you'll be able to shake yourself and snap off the ropes, like, just like you always did. It's the same reason you can get a new car, but if you're not careful, eventually it'll smell just like your old one. The problem's not the car. The problem's your behavior. Wow. New car, same you. <laughs> same choices. Same de decisions. Eventually, same outcome, which is why we need to watch ourselves the moment we change like a hawk. We got to watch ourselves very carefully, knowing this about ourselves, because uh, if you keep doing what you always did, you keep getting what you always got. And if God calls you to do something new, to act instantly on it, if you don't keep doing it, you will not keep the change. And this is all over scripture. Watch yourself like a hawk. Watch yourself like a hawk. Watch yourself very carefully. Uh, it's in the book of, of Galatians. Galatians says, keep an eye on yourself. It's in what Paul said to Timothy. He said, keep a close watch on yourself. It's in the book of Acts. This was to the Ephesian elders. Keep watch over yourselves. It's in the book of 2 John. Look to yourselves. Look to yourselves. Watch yourself. Keep a close eye on yourself. Yourself is tricksy. You got to watch yourself, right? There's a devil. Sure, there's a world. Yeah, but I got enough problems just minding my own dang self. I don't know about you. I, gotta, I, 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 don't, I don't trust myself more than I can throw myself. I can't throw myself very far. Got to watch yourself like a hawk. Hawks see eight times better than humans do. Crazy good vision. 
I was researching it. I spent way too much time this week. I thought a follow-up book might need to happen. Through the eyes of a hawk, right? Watching yourself like a hawk. Apparently, I mean, it's amazing, because we only have humans do 180 degree field of vision. They have almost 360 degrees. With their eyes positioned on the side of their heads, they can see stuff that's basically behind them. They, they got eyes on the back of their head. Their bird eyes are straight Wonkville, you know what I mean? Like just. <laughs> And they can see stuff so far away, and they have to because they can travel like 150 miles an hour, and they have to be able to see where they're, because they're going to get there in a moment. So they got to see way, 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 way ahead of them. And they just, they do this thing called wheeling up in the sky. It's just, just round and round they go. They don't have to flap. They can just throw on a glide, and, and they're looking, looking, looking. A mouse, a grasshopper. They said if you had eyes as good, of a hawk, as, good as a hawk does, you would be able to be up on a 10-story building watching ants crawl around on the ground below. That's just straight crazy. And then I read this one article that said that they, they have this new laser surgery that eventually they say could give humans like 25 vision, where right, like where, where right now something you would have to be five feet away from to make out carefully, you would be able to see at 20 feet, that we would have eyes about half as good as a hawk's eyes. I said, that's straight Avenger stuff. A hawk eye, give me a bow and arrow, I will, I will do it. I don't know. Uh, but I need that for myself. I need that for me. I need that to keep an eye on myself, because I know myself and what I'm capable of, of the trouble I'm able to get myself into, and the thought patterns that I re resort to and revert to, and habits and old ways of, of life that spring back in, and the way I give into temptation. Yeah, we change. That's great. That's only half the battle. Now you got to keep it. Oh, you caught the car. Good job, doggy. Now, now what are you going to do with it? Like, how are you going to keep this change? And that's our question. How do we protect our progress? Because know this, your soul doesn't have cruise control. And if you're not, if, if you're not uh, actively tracking, you will always be backtracking. The moment you let yourself out of your sight, you will be out of control. So you have to watch yourself like a hawk. You have to almost visualize yourself watching yourself, saying the things you say, doing the things you do, monitoring your progress so that you're not letting those things slip. You will drift if you don't pay attention. Drifting is our default state. Take your hands off the wheel driving down the highway. What happened? Your car will immediately begin to drift. It will not stay between the lines, and neither will you. We have to watch ourselves. Active retention is the price you have to pay for, no, nope, I said it wrong. Active attention is the price you must pay for retention. That's why it's called paying attention. You have to pay, the price is attention, in order to have retention. You will lose your change if you don't keep paying attention to it and keep watching it and monitoring it, all right? So, uh, so, so what do we need to know then? Here we go. Losing the change becomes easier when, number one, you let the wrong people in. Know this about yourself. Losing your change, it will be easy, the easiest thing in the world the moment you begin letting the wrong people in. Of course, all of us are just probably as flabbergasted as Nehemiah to think of them letting Tobiah have a room in the house of God. But think about it. They eventually were worn down in his advances. We know he kept trying to sugar talk Nehemiah, sugar talk Nehemiah, come meet with me, I love you. That was one of his things he tried to do. He tried to distract him, tried to make it seem like he was his best friend, and Nehemiah saw through it. But eventually, he kept this up. The people gave in. And I'm sure he wasn't living in the, the, the temple the first time he came. He was like, oh, I just want to come to dinner. Let's just have a meeting. Nehemiah's not around. He doesn't love you anymore, right? Let's, let's just come talk, and, and I have some ideas. And, and, the event, and they, like the enemy, he's never going to be satisfied with just a, a toe in your life. He's always going to want more. He's all, you give him an inch, he's going to want a mile. He's going to want to shove his way. And you can't let him in. The Bible says sin is like a little bit of leaven. And the moment you make a little bit of compromise, you're just opening yourself up to more, opening yourself to more. It's that proverbial one degree. And when you're doing life with the wrong people, it becomes easier to make those kinds of decisions because you compare yourself to them. 
And at first you think, I'm doing good because they're so much worse than me, right? And so you'll feel good, but eventually you begin to settle. Eventually there's going to be a homeostasis. And we should always have active relationship. We're trying to reach people, love people. We have to be doing life with people who have the same values that we do. Otherwise, we will drift off course, which is what happened to them. And we'll eventually end up doing things we would say, I never would have done. Do you think at the revival, when they were signing the certificate, they would have ever believed they would come to a place of renting out part of the temple to a sworn enemy of, of their progress. I, I say no. But behavior is contagious. Behavior is contagious. Fortunately, so is good behavior. And that's why we pick the right people. We'll go to the right places. You know, I was reading about hawks a little, like I told you, and I found out that a, a group of hawks, a flock of hawks, that's fun to say, <laughs> flock of hawks, is uh, called a kettle gaggle of geese. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, a murder of crows. Yeah, that's what they're called. Uh, there's also a conspiracy of ravens. Like, did they give like naming rights to Ed, Edgar Allan Poe? A, a conspiracy of ravens. But the hawks are called a kettle. And, and that's because they often, when they get together, it's to do what I told you about, the wheeling, that circular tornado-like activity. And they say it looks like water boiling in a kettle. And so they call it kettling. And look at the picture. Kettling, 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 kettling. They often do it just before migration, just before they're going to move south for the winter. But the kettling, they say, is a form of communication, a way of gaining altitude, and a way of conserving strength. And I wonder if that's not why God wants you to be all up in a Fresh Life group, to have relationships in your life so you could do some kettling, so you could stay hot, so you could conserve energy, so you could communicate with one another, so you also could gain altitude and get higher than you could go by yourself. We need each other. Losing your change becomes easier when you let the wrong people in. Number two, losing the change becomes easier when you are ambiguous about your change. Ambiguous about your change. We've all been there, though. We say stuff like, I, I just want to love God more. Love God more. Or I, I just want to get healthier. I want to be friendlier. I want to be a better mom. I want to have a better marriage. The problem with ambiguous language like that is that exceptions become incredibly easy, and there's no definitive way to track your progress. And if you're not tracking, you're backtracking. So there's no way to know, like on any given day, do I feel like a better husband? Do I feel like a better Christian? Do I feel it's so arbitrary? And there's nothing concrete about that. Uh, Chip and Dan Heath in their book, Switch, which I highly recommend this book to all of you who would want to change in any way. It's the gold standard on change in, in, in a team, in your relationship, in a life, in a habit. Uh, they said, we're all loophole exploiting lawyers when it comes to our own self-control. Wow. You'll honor your one glass rule by filling your glass all the way to the brim. Or you'll mentally trade an X drink now for a zero drink night in the speculative future. Have we not all done that one, though? Could be with working out. Could be with the, oh, I just had seven cheat meals. Now I can't have a cheat meal for two, a month and a half, but, but I'm trading future. So, so that's, that's, that's a problem with, with, with language that leaves that, 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 that open. We have to be super specific. Um, uh, Jack Welch, the, the, the CEO of GE, he, he made famous these SMART goals. And every goal should, should be able to pass through the, the SMART test. Is it specific? Is it measurable? Is it attainable? Is it relevant, meaning will the battle win the war? And is it time-based in some way? So every good goal should be, I want to be from here to here by when. I want to be from here to here by when. So you don't say, I want to, I want to be healthier. Your, your big stretch goal would be looking off into the future. I want to lose this much weight by this point, or I want to be able to do a marathon by this point, or, or, or whatever it was. But then you have to also dice it up and make little chunk goals that are going to get you there, that you can actively measure every single day in the present and not in the future. What battles do I have to figure out, and how specific can I make them? Uh, so like Nehemiah knew, if these people need to not uh, better time management, better relationships, and be better. No, he said, no, no working on the Sabbath day, the first dollar out of every 10 that God gives you. And, and no relationships with anyone who does not white hot in love with God. So, so, so that's an easy way to do it. There's no wiggle room in that. 
and, and eventually they probably got to ambiguous language and began making exceptions, began to be the loophole exploiting lawyers that all of us become when we're not watching ourselves like a hawk. So we have to know that when we're ambiguous, we're making it easy for ourselves to lose our change. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. All right, I got a third. Uh, it's easy to lose the change uh, when you don't shape your environment for success. You have to shape your environment for success. Don't leave everything to willpower. Do what you can to make it easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing. I love so much that Nehemiah had the wisdom. He saw the problem the moment he got there, didn't he? What the heck are these men of Tyre doing allowed to set up their markets in our city? We built this city. We, we built this city on honoring God. And you signed this covenant, and there's walls and gates, so we can shut out anybody we want and let in anybody we want. Now, we like the men of Tyre. They bring fish. They're Phoenicians. They, they have good things to sell. Let them come sell it on a Monday. Let them come sell it on a Wednesday. Let them come sell it on a Thursday. But why would we let them set up their flea market, pop-up food truck market on a day that we don't want to be eating these things and working from them and buying from them and selling from them? So he immediately saw, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in the world. Maybe when they first started it, the, the, the men of Tyre were like, maybe Tobiah was, said it. Oh, what if we just set them up on that day so they're ready for the next one? And then, and then it led to, well, a couple hours into it, it's not bad to get a jump start on it because we're loophole exploiting lawyers with our own change. We're not walking, watching ourselves like, ah. Oh. And then eventually it's just full blown. So Nehemiah walks in and goes, if you don't want to be buying and selling and working, why would you allow the marketplace to be going? This is easy. You guys get out of here. Take the option off the table. Come on, somebody, shut the gates. Shut the gates. You don't hang out at Krispy Kreme if you don't want to eat donuts. You don't hang out at a bar if you're not wanting to drink, if it's a struggle for you. I mean, you have to make conscious decisions. You've got to make it easy for yourself. I, I, I have to lay out my gym clothes the night before if I'm going to work out, because it's a greater failure to put them away than to put them on. So I have to step over them. Little things like this, uh, turning off notifications when you're wanting to work, turning your phone onto airplane mode. That chime that tells you you have a new email is basically just begging for yourself when you need to get something done to not be able to function like you should. You have to look at your life and go, what gates do I need to shut? What decisions do I need to make? Should I arrange someone to pick me up? Let's pick each other up each week for church, because it's so easy for me to go, ah, you know, the weather outside is frightful, and going skiing would be so delightful. But if you say, hey, pick me up this week, I'll pick you up next week. I know myself. I got to watch myself like a hawk. I, I need you to check out of me. I need you. I need this accountability. I need to kettle together with somebody, or otherwise this is not going to happen. Can you ask me about this? Enlisting accountability. You have to shape your environment for the success that you want. You have to limit yourself access to the triggers. Yeah. Willpower is a, it's, this is a fact, is a depletable commodity. And you get tired from using it. And so the more you can fight yourself away from even having access to the things that you know are going to trigger the behavior that you don't want to do, the easier you're going to make it for yourself. This is, just, this is hopefully just helpful preaching. Um, we got to keep that sho shovel and keep that sword going as we protect our progress. All right, there's a fourth. Now, losing the change becomes easier when you have too much time on your hands. Too much time on your hands. What is interesting to me about reading Nehemiah is that the, the problems that we're dealing with here really started when the building stopped. They were so busy building, they didn't really have time to go be messing around. They were so busy getting the serpent gate and the dung gate and this gate and that gate and this gate. They were so busy. They were so tired. They're sleeping good at night. They're not really having time to be messing around and get attracted to Ammonites and be running over here with the parasites because they were so busy just doing God's work. They're, they were up all day, fired up, singing, whistling while they were, getting stuff done. They had a cause. They had a fight. So always keep yourself in a fight. Always keep yourself fired up on a cause. Always serve constantly. There's still more widows. There's still still more loveless. There's still more homeless. There's still more that don't know. And if you just make yourself available, fill up the time that you would be sitting around on the computer. Fill up the time that you'd just be sitting around Netflix and chill. You have to, you have to make your life built in such a way where you're always a part of something bigger than you. 
And that's what's so powerful about the church, is that we, no matter what we do in the world, no matter what we do for our work, if, if, if we, we get to come together as one to keep the work going. The, the construction is never done. The 10 always becomes the new zero. We're always going to go after the new desert to bring the river to, the new wilderness to bring the road to. We're not going to pour our Gatorade and celebrate and now kick back and enjoy the wares from the men of Tyre. We got to keep fighting. We got to keep going. We got to keep dreaming. We got to keep believing. Hey, come on. We got to reach just one more. Got to carry that one. That's, that's the power of serving constantly. In the moment, you're like, you know, I'm just going to chill for a bit. You're cruising for a bruising because your soul doesn't have cruise control. So you're going to begin to drift. Just ask David. Stop going out to the battles. And eventually, it's just walking around and, then, and getting himself into into trouble. I got one last thing. We're going to pray. Losing the change becomes easier, not just when you let the wrong people in, not just when you're ambiguous, not just when you don't shape your environment for success, not just when you have too much time on your hands, but also when you misunderstand failure, when you misunderstand the very nature of what failure is, what you're seeing when you fail. I imagine the moment they broke the covenant for the first time, the devil really capitalized on that. He tempted them to do it, but then he shamed them for it. Maybe Tobiah was the mouthpiece of it. So he says, just buy a little bit on this day. Just work a little bit on this day. Oh, well, you don't need that tithe. And, and once he got them to stop tithing, then it, well, you don't even need the, the room back there. You're not tithing. There's not food going into it. You're spending all your money at the food trucks that come in on the day they shouldn't be here. So now what do you need that room for? There's no, there's no tithe money coming in. The priests are off having to get a different job. So let's just let me live there. And, and, and every single thing built on itself, built on itself, built on itself. And he made them feel shame and pain and regret over the fact that they, he's like, didn't you sign a covenant saying you wouldn't? So there's no point now. No point now. Nehemiah wouldn't even want you now. God wouldn't even want you now. You're miserable failures now. And they misunderstood probably the nature of failure. And it became a thing where I can't show my face at church. Look what I've done. I can't, I can't go pray to God. Look what I did, how I betrayed him. I've got to clean myself up a little bit. Then maybe he'll want me. Then maybe he'll want me. Not understanding the nature of grace. Not understanding the heart of our God. Not understanding what it means to be a prodigal son or daughter and have your father rush to you with his arms open that you can always return. You can always come back. You can always arise and go to Jesus and in his arms there will always be 10,000 charms contract voided you just don't understand failure you know I came across this interesting statistic because nicotine was one of those hard things to kick and it's one of those things we think of when we think of New Year's resolutions and change and, and all that and people are like I want to quit smoking and I, I was reading about how they say two out of three people who say they want to quit smoking have never tried two out of three they say that they want to quit they've never tried and that nine out of 10 who try will fail. Nine out of 10 who try will, will fail and, and relapse back to it. Okay, now here, here's, here's the most interesting thing though. They say that on average, anybody who successfully does quit smoking like they want to, fails about six times first. You'll fail six times before you eventually kick it. And doesn't that just tell you something different about failure? It's necessary on the road to success. And who do we think we are to think that we're never going to make a mistake or we're never going to lose a battle? The, the key is to view failure as, as, as not a, a place to set up camp and live forever, but rather the, the road is going to be made in the wilderness. And it's not a parking lot and it's not in a hotel. So when you find yourself in the dry place of failure, when you find your place falling, yourself falling down once again into a wilderness place, into a desert place, just remember it's not a parking lot. It's not a hotel. It's a road. And if you're on a road, you can get back up. We can kick to buy out and we can keep on going and we can begin tithing and we can begin honoring God with our love life and we can it's never too late because the righteous man can fall down seven times but every single time he can get back up and I came to tell you that no matter how much you've messed up no matter how much you've lost no matter how much you slid backwards that today's a brand new day and God's grace it has not been exhausted and his compassions they don't fail he's faithful he loves you he hasn't given up on you so today's a day to receive his grace and to start over again and to honor God with your presence and in time it will become a new past that you're proud of what God's done in you. 
So don't give up and keep believing that the best truly is yet to come so long as it's called today. Would you pray with me? I just wanna pray over you and just know that, that there's so many of us that we feel touched by this. And, and if you're in any way just feeling God speak to you, would you just raise your hand up to God just as a way of saying, God, this message touched me. And there's some progress at one point I fought for that I've lost. And there's some ground that I've lost. And at one point I had this, but now that I see it, I, I have drifted in this way and I'm backtracking in this way and I'm not retaining the change because I'm not paying attention to it. And so I hear what you're saying. And, and God, would you just touch every heart in every location who's dealing with this conviction that you're just speaking to them, not out of shame, but because you love them, because you're calling them to something better, because you're calling them to something more. So I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would begin to even now, God, help them to see that they're no longer a slave. They've been redeemed by Jesus, by the blood of the Lamb. They're a son or daughter of the King and whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. So give them your pace, peace and give them your grace and lead them into the broad place you want them to. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's lift up our voices and thank God for his goodness and thank God for his grace. Well, what another superb message. And uh, we need to just keep taking these things on board, don't we, as we go through uh, the series and make a mental note, but also put into practice the things that we're learning. We're going to uh, be on a Zoom meeting shortly uh, and be able to discuss the message a bit further and pray for each other. If you're able to join us, the details are on the screen. It would be great for you to, to be with us so that we can meet with you on that. Uh, if you're unable to do that, then that's fine and hope to see you again soon. So thanks for joining us and God bless. Have a good week.
He's made a way for all Mercy waits where sinners fall He is our victory